give us some time for a Q&A session at the end and we'll try and wrap up by around four o'clock. Um, so without further ado, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our first speaker today, Tom Williamson. Um, Tom is a professor of history at the University of East Anglia. Over the years, much of Tom's work has focused on East Anglia, Hertfordshire and Northamptonshire. Um, Tom has a particular interest in the history of trees and woodlands, medieval field systems and settlement patterns, as well as medieval estate landscapes and agricultural improvement. Um, among other things, Tom is the co-founder of the uh, Rural History Journal and seems to be tirelessly releasing new work, um, having written over 45 new books, I think, Tom. So, um, yeah, over to you. Thank you very much, Annie. That makes me feel suitably old. Now, let's hope the technology is going to work. Can you see that, Annie? Yeah, is that... yeah that's perfect. OK, well, um, thanks. Thanks a lot um, for that. And it's very nice to be here. Um, as Annie says, I'm a historian, but I've got a, a lot of interests in um, ecology and historical ecology. And that's kind of where I'm I'm uh, I'm coming from. Wait a minute. Yeah, there we go. Rewilding now. Um, rewilding. I won't say rewilding the new rock and roll, um, but it is it is uh, fashionable. It is a, a trend. One might almost say it's a fad. And I just want to uh, pick at it a little bit, not in a sense of criticizing rewilding per se, and certainly not the wonderful work that people like Dominic are doing here at Ken Hill, but just to think about some of the limits, to raise some of the potential dangers not in rewilding per se, but in where we apply it and how much we emphasize it as a panacea to the problems we're facing. Um, and uh, that approach, I suppose, comes from my, my background as a landscape historian, uh, brought up with Hoskins and Christopher Taylor, but in particular with Oliver Rackham. And Rackham, of course, uh, the great historical ecologist, historian of the countryside, he he saw the landscape as uniting natural history and human history. He understood well that what we think of as nature, the, the particular balance of species in England, which we used to, were the result of the kind of habitats we'd created. So nature for Rackham doesn't, didn't exist as something separate from humanity, but something which humanity had shaped. And indeed, when we look at something like an ancient hedge, that mix of species is both historically informative and it provides habitat for wildlife, but it names one of the very fact we talk about Jack in the hedge, hedgehogs, hedge sparrows and the rest emphasizes, I think, the extent to which nature over centuries, over millennia has been molded and shaped by human activity. So it's a rather different approach to rewilding, which emphasizes the removal of human intervention and engagement. So that's kind of where I'm coming from. And, and I just, before I start properly, just want to emphasize this, this more general point that, that we've shaped nature to such an extent that the things we value, the relative importance, the relative rarity of things has been determined essentially by us. We wouldn't we, we would worry about the importance of dandelions if we had shaped a world in which dandelions were rare. Now, for a long time then, with Rackham and, and really with, up with others until the rise of rewilding, we looked at nature as something shaped by human activity and particular habitats shaped by economic and agricultural activities. So here we have people making hay very picturesquely, making hay on <clears throat> low lying grassland, included excluding livestock um, for the main growing season and removing biomass. And the result of those processes was a particular collection of plants. There's nothing natural in the concentration of globe flower and Michaelmas daisy and the rest that you get oxide daisy, sorry, in, in hay meadows. That's the result of particular ways they've been managed over very long periods. And if we stopped managing them like that, we would rapidly lose that ensemble of species. 
Similarly with ancient woodland, ancient woodland intensively managed in the past. I mean, I, completely different than the way we see them now, which is tends to be more neglected, um, managed in the past so that the actual main species were determined by uh, management. <clears throat> For a long time, people used to think that oak was the dominant tree in the natural vegetation because they thought of ancient woods as being surviving fragments of the natural vegetation. But oak is dominant in ancient woods because people encouraged its growth there. It's good for a whole range of constructional uses. Um, and and the, as many of you will know, the, the, the dominant tree in the wild vegetation in lowland England was probably the small leafed lime, which is now, certainly in Norfolk, really pretty rare. Small leaf lime wasn't as economically valuable as oak. There's no reason to maintain it. Uh, the coppice too is 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 selected, but the act of coppicing this the, this management of ancient woods by repeatedly cutting down uh, on a long rotation most of the underwood and letting it regrow that in itself shaped the flora. Um, here we have a wood anemone. Um, the, that particular distinctive flora of woodland is shaped by the recurrent cycles of of felling, uh, burst of light gradual recovery of the plants and then shading out again. But it's also critically shaped by the fact that woods were enclosed to keep livestock out. That was critical because the livestock would, would eat the regrowth of the coppice. And most of those indicative woodland species are very sensitive to grazing pressure. And crucially, woodland was one of the few areas in the medieval and indeed post-medieval landscape uh, from which animals were routinely excluded. So again, shaped by human activity, and as human activity has, has ceased, um, these have become effectively derelict factories for the production of wood and timber. We could go through others. Heaths uh, managed by grazing of livestock in particular ways. In East Anglia in particular, the livestock often graze by day, but shifted off somewhere else by night so they could dung the arable land. Um, but heaths also critically shaped by fuel extraction. Thomas Blenhassett in 1610 thought the Horsford Heath, as you can see here, was mainly about the production of fuel. Occasionally they were ploughed, but all that shaped particular kind of particular range of vegetation. And again, once we start managing them, uh, we have a fight on our hands to stop woodland regeneration, first to birch and then to oak. Mousehold Heath is a great example of this huge heath outside uh, Norwich, uh, largely enclosed, but small fragment left in the 19th century. Early illustrations show it as completely treeless, but hold is a corruption of halt, uh, meaning wood. Uh, in, in the 13th century, there are letters from the Bishop of Norwich's land agent effectively saying, if we don't do something about managing mousehold wood better, it will, we'll lose it. The commoners were basically stripping it of, of, of timber and wood. Uh, but once enclosed, it then regenerated. One, it was no longer being grazed. And it's a moot point, what is the natural vegetation of mousehold heath? Is it, is it this open uh, man-made landscape or is it this rewilded landscape featuring sycamore and, and, and oak? So it, habitats, environments and wildlife over hundreds of years have been shaped by practical agricultural activities. And those practical agricultural activities have changed over time. And I won't take you through this diagram, but changes in population density, changes in, in the forms of, uh, of, of social organization, economic organization have shifted and changed to some extent the character of those, those habitats. Until we get to the post-war period where technological transformation, um, the final ending of, of using those areas for, for, for fuel, et cetera, led to the crisis in wildlife, the Arabization of much of Eastern England, the, the, the um, development of secondary woodland on, on heaths and the rest, all the problems we're now facing. Now, crisis in wildlife, how do we deal with it? Well, one, popular response is we say all that stuff uh, we, is, is over. 
we, we those economic activities which shape wildlife have to come to an end or changed um we could only perpetuate them as a kind of wildlife gardening solution and it really won't work we've got to do something radical we've got to do rewilding now the problem with discussing rewilding is it means mean so many things to different people. At one extreme, this kind of rewilding heavy kind of nep estate style or what's being proposed in some of the highland areas of England, where ideally you would have alpha predators and graziers keeping a kind of graze woodland environment open. But it, it's often used just to mean roughing things up a bit. And sometimes it doesn't seem to be much more than what we used to call nature conservation but this kind of rewilding heavy this return to grazed woodland uh, grazed by herbivores kept in check by um alpha predators like wolves um that is based on a certain view of the original pre-farming vegetation which we associate with franz vera Vera believed that we didn't have wall-to-wall -wall woodland in this country we had more open environments kept open by graziers and that's the kind of model most people are trying to reconstruct well just flag up that that isn't fact this is contested um, there is much debate continuing about whether about precisely what the nature of the early landscape was um, and, and indeed that plus things like the disappearance effectively of smalled leaf lime should highlight and make us aware just how far we are away from it, from from Eden, we can't easily recreate it. And one particular reason why we can't really recreate it is the extent of introductions. That our ecology is now full of things which were not there before farming began. We remember the obvious ones: grey squirrel, monk jack deer, horrible looking but tastes good. Um, but we forget. Often the fallow deer are introductions, that the brown rats are an introduction, the black rats are an introduction, the house mice is an introduction, the rabbit is an introduction. Indeed, rabbit was an introduction which was originally effectively a domesticate, kept in specially built mounds and provided with their own little purpose built burrows. It's only as they gradually escaped and went, went native that we began to think of them as something essentially wild. Um, and then, of course, there's plants. Um, uh, um, Japanese balsam, uh, Himalayan knotweed, rhododendron, those are all familiar. Sycamore, weird ones. Uh, snowdrop almost certainly introduction. Good case of snake said fritillary being a garden escapee. And the one that really blew my mind when I got interested in all this was poppies. Poppies and cereal weeds, they're not part of our indigenous vegetation. So whatever we do, we're not returning anything to what it was originally. We're, we're, we'll be managing some kind of strange, motley, polyglot, weird nature. But of course, another question, is removing human intervention really the best way of sustaining bio biodiversity? And that's a question about what did traditional forms of land management achieve up until the 20th century? And indeed, what could they still achieve in modified form or in mimicked form? Well, this is something that uh, I worked with Paul Dolman and Jerry Barnes and Rob Fuller on um, and various articles, which uh, if you email me, I can not send you. I don't know I've got them, but I can certainly tell you where to get them. Uh, and we worked looking at, at what these things did, because what they delivered were extremely high levels of biodiversity. A lot of traditional practices involve high levels of resource exploitation and extraction, involving repeated cycles of harvesting, causing frequent disturbance and dynamic vegetation change rather than long-term stability. You coppice, it regrows. You lay a hedge, it regrows. You lay it again, it regrows. Um, they involve regular removal of biomass from many areas, cutting heaths, cutting woods, cutting hedges. They involved endless disturbance to get raw materials. Heaths in particular and other common land are dug over. This is Nettishall Heath, uh, the diagram. The green is all the extraction pits. 
it involved really fine scales of of um uh, of of different forms of exploitation it, open field strips for example separated by narrow margins of unplowed ground carrying um uh, a grassland herb rich grassland which then reinvaded during the the fallow seasons very detailed very complex meshes of hedgerows and the rest um and active interventions which are completely different from rewilding which either prevented or encourage the movement of livestock. So livestock might be excluded from coppices or, or sheep might be moved daily from the heaths to the arable, depleting the heaths of nutrients. So they're complicated systems, but the intensity of management demonstrably racked up biodiversity. So bear that in mind, and let's just turn to some of what I think are the practical limits to rewilding. I mean, to go back to the issue of introductions, uh, people often talk about rewilding the uplands. The uplands, there was a problem about invasive rhododendron. If you actually left them to their own devices, parts of the Peak District, which would become a rhododendron thicket 20 miles across. Um, locally, and this comes through to the definition of rewilding. This is one of Emerson's pictures showing uh, reed cutters, surprisingly clean and healthy looking reed cutters in the 19th century in open reed beds. Reed beds because management ceased in the 1920s and 30s that regenerated to older car. Reed bed goes to older car. You could say that's a form of miniature rewilding if you want to, but the losses in terms of habitat are massive. It's management that's keeping them open and therefore good for marsh harriers and the rest and take this little bugger i don't know what he is uh I, it's not my area of expertise but i can tell you he lives on dry disturbed heathland particularly in breckland um in conditions which are entirely unnatural uh in, and uh, because uh the the way of managing the heaths has been reduced and many of the heaths have gone he's now very very restricted but he needs disturbed dry sandy close grazed land uh, and not very shaded. So in other words, if we decided that rewilding should be targeted at those particular heaths, it might be bye-bye to him, whatever he is. We've, we've altered environments so much and then mangled them that the, some of this stuff is tenuously hanging on and this kind of confident broad brush, we must rewild may potentially be a threat. More widely, moving away from nature conservation, there's another issue which troubles me and I think a lot of other people. And again, it's connected with this kind of impassioned, um, almost religious fervor that some rewilders have. Because landscapes are not only about nature conservation, they have a cultural historical importance. They, they provide a sense of place. And large scale eradication, uh, large scale rewilding consciously eradicates history. Um, in, it's seen as a benefit by people like George Monbiot. You don't want signs of human activity to disrupt the enjoyment. And much of what people talk about is about us, note, and our enjoyment of the experience of rewilding. We don't want signs of human activity there. So things get removed from their place in a way. If you think of, of Breckland in East Anglia, landscape of great open heathlands, uh, gradually enclosed, but fragments of the heath surviving, large fragments until the 20th century, where many of them were planted up as forestry plantations. A few weren't. Here's Nettishall Heath, some plantations established, as you can see, in the course of the 19th century. This is how it looked in the early 20th. This is what it looks like now. Now, there's a long and complex history here, uh, but Suffolk Wildlife Trust now manage it, and they manage it very well. Some of the areas are kept as open heath, but they actually don't want to keep some of it as open heath. They want, in fact, majority of it to be grazed Vera-esque woodland. Now, there are arguments for that in terms of biodiversity, but it doesn't look like Breckland. It has ceased to be Breckland. And indeed, in some of the publicity, um, they openly say they want Nettishall to be East Anglia's new forest. Um, now, to me, a view like this is rich in history, 
cultural history, social history, economic history, as well as being pretty good for wildlife. That would be, if you were to turn that into one huge rewilded reserve, you would be eradicating that history and that sense of place. And then there are wider cultural importance. I, I don't think that Dedham Vale, celebrated in Constable's paintings, for example, would be a good place to rewild. I think we would sever, we would cut that connection with our appreciation of the art. I'm not convinced that Howarth Moors, uh, which was inspiration for Wuthering Heights, would be a good place. It, again, it's culturally important, may not be a good place to radically change from the kind of scene described by Bronte. And indeed, some landscapes are art. Capability Brown shaped wonderful landscapes like this at Kimberley. There he is, looking smug and rich. Um, this is one of his most wonderful creations in Hertfordshire at Ashridge, uh, the Golden Valley, so-called. I wouldn't like to see that rewilded. It's a work of art. It's fantastically done, cutting that swathe uh, through the bottom of the valley, leaving the wooded slopes above. It's an amazing thing. So we have, we, we have to think about the limits about where we can actually do this stuff. Interestingly, Brown described his own landscapes as natural, as did contemporaries. And there was therefore then in the 18th century a major row, some of you will know, with Richard Payne Knight and Uvedale Price criticizing those landscapes as not being natural enough. And indeed, in uh, what the Price's publication, nice publication, sorry, is an illustration showing the typical brown version of nature and what they want to replace it with. 18th century wee wilding. There's nothing entirely new in this world. Now, other practical problems. We live in a crowded nation. We're heading for 70 million people. We import, uh, we import a good 40% of our foodstuffs. We are heading for major world food shortages. We need to think about food security. Uh, the idea of putting large areas out of cultivation is problematic in terms of good farmland, whereas possibly thinking of farmland, regenerative farming of the kind we're gonna hear about in a minute, of integrating traditional forms of husbandry may be a more feasible way of addressing both food and nature. It's a crowded old world. But in that crowded world, of course, um, uh, changes are happening. And one of the worries I personally have is that rewilding, in a sense, is, is giving sanction to something that may be happening, that is happening anywhere, anyway across Europe. Um, which is the abandonment of farming on marginal land and regeneration of woodland as a result, um, with great loss to cultural landscapes, but arguably great loss to biodiversity. And indeed, we're almost moving, sleepwalking into a situation where we would envisage the landscape as a three-part thing. Mega cities, we're looking at some of them here, intensively farmed land, where nature conservation is of less importance, and wilderness. Wilderness, rewilded areas on the peripheries. But the trouble with that is that, uh, well, actually, before we come to that, it's happening in a sense in England. And I just want to show these maps, although it's not much to do with what I'm talking about, but it's another of the great myths. England is losing trees and woodland, is losing trees and woodland except he isn't losing trees and woodland because of small-scale rewilding regeneration on land no, proper, no longer managed along traditional lines. That's the distribution of woodland in the density of woodland in uh, 1895, and that's the density now. To go back to what I was saying, if we think of moving towards a mega city, agricultural area, rewilded area, Rewilding is physically separate, it's marginal, it's distant. And it's okay for Guardian reading people in Hampstead to go and have glamping holidays at it, but it doesn't help the poor, the old, and the disabled to encounter nature. You do that on the urban fringe, 
in the countryside, in the park. So too much emphasis on rewilding has a kind of, to me, a slightly elitist view. So I will support rewilding strongly in the right locations, but they have to be thought about hard. Until that happens, I will fight to preserve all those man-made landscapes which have inspired artists, which preserve history, and which are a home for wildlife. Whether they're chalk downland or moors or heaths or wetlands or woodland or whatever they are. So rewilding certainly has its place in future conservation policy. If, if I sound like a big critical of it, it's I think critical of the way it's it's sort of unchallenged and not interrogated enough as a concept. And I think we need to be a lot clearer about what we mean when we use the term, whether we're talking about, you know, big scale stuff or whether we're talking about roughing up a bit. It, 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 there's a vagueness about it. But it needs to be one approach amongst others and maintaining, restoring or mimicking traditional forms of intensive land management are also key. And that seems to me a way of integrating conservation and food production. We, we need to be careful where we rewild and we need not, we mustn't concentrate on rewilding so much that we take our eye off the other balls in play. Rewilding isn't a panacea, rewilding is a word. Great, thank you so much, Tom. Um, and I'm sure you've given lots of people food for thought and um, please do um, put questions into the um, Q&A bar if you've got questions for Tom later on. Um, I know I've got several lined up already, Tom. So um, we'll move on to those later. Um, so our next speaker for today is Jake Fines. Uh, Jake is the Director of Conservation at the Holcomb Estate in North Norfolk. Uh, the Holcomb Estate covers about 25,000 acres and includes a nature reserve, which is visited by almost a million people a year. Jake has a wealth of knowledge with over 30 years of uh, experience of managing landscapes, having worked at Nep Castle in West Sussex, to working as an estate manager at the Raveningham Estate in Norfolk before his move to Holcombe in 2018. So Jake, without further ado, over to you. Oh, you're on mute, mate. You're on, you're on mute, Jake. Um, thank you, I didn't Annie. mean to call you mate, I meant Jake. <laughs> um, thank you very much. And as ever, wonderful presentation from Tom. I would expect nothing less. Um, so. Uh, I share I share many of his uh, many of his views, um, uh, but what I'm trying to do currently is to ensure that we uh, make space for nature in our in the way we currently look after our landscapes, understanding the history, understanding the need for um, protecting our historical environmental assets, um, uh, while still producing food. Uh, we're expecting to have a global population of uh, uh, 9 billion by 2030 and the challenges on the way we produce food and the impacts that food has on our environments and climate change are currently under hot topic, uh, hot topic in Glasgow. Um, UK agriculture uh, is responsible for 10% of uh, CO2 emissions uh, globally. Uh, 40% 40, 40 of uh, habitable land is uh, managed for agriculture globally, and that um, is responsible for 25% of global emissions. Um, so agriculture in its current form has to change. Um, and we are slowly, there is an emerging group of individuals of farmers and landowners and land occupiers across the globe, looking at the way we can produce food that is sustainable, and environmental. So if we look at the, you know, having worked in Norfolk since the uh, mid nineties and seeing um, uh, excessive use of prophylactic spraying, spraying to ensure that everything of the natural world is in check or destroyed, whether that be plant or parasite or, or strangely even butterfly. Um, and, uh, and, we, and we had a dramatic effect. So we've seen, uh, if we look at the farmer and breeding bird index, uh, which 50% of species since 1970 have seen a decline. Um, incidentally, 
the remaining other 50% have seen an increase. So we know, and as Tom has described, we have impacts on our natural environments. We have impacts on our uh, on our habitats, on our water quality, on our um, air quality uh, through agriculture. But I'm I'm of the firm belief that agriculture can change. And it can change in a way that we start to understand how nature works and we can start to mimic it in a food production, in our food production systems. So um, the, uh, the protection of our water courses, uh, we need to buffer them. So we know that we get diffuse pollution from uh, chemical runoff or nutrient runoff. And currently farmers have been challenged uh, with new um, rules for water, the Environment Agency have now uh, put in place where we cannot spread organic manures on our farmland in uh, in the autumn and win uh, winter months for fear that that's having impact on our water quality. Interestingly, uh, if you're a if you're a water uh, company, um, those rules don't necessarily apply, and you can uh, currently uh, put your raw sewage straight into river systems. Um, so, so we have all these challenges, and what I, what I've been a big advocate for is actually making our farms farmland more economic. And if I give an example of one of the farms at Holcomb, which uh, we took on, which uh, was the classic nineteen nineties uh, smash and grab style agriculture uh, tarmac farming, where a contractor would come in from miles away and deep cultivate and maximize uh, input for maximum output um, uh, with short, short thought through rotations, roots followed by roots, followed by roots, followed by maize, uh, which had devastating effects on the, 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 the quality and the structure and the vibrancy of the soil. So um, we took this farm back and the first thing I did was to, to actually talk to the farming team, the, the the guys with mud on their boots, how can we make this farm more efficient? We've invested in machinery that, you know, quarter of a million pounds worth of sprayer that has a 36 meter boom on it. Uh, and it's trying, we're trying to farm in a medieval uh, landscape. Interestingly, most of, uh, and Tom will correct me if I'm wrong, but most of um, Holcomb is a Enclosure Act landscape. I can see a few remnants in the hedges where the hedges are significantly older than 1805. Um, but predominantly, most of Holcomb's fields were um, created in the in in the uh, in 1805. Um, but actually, they still don't suit. Even them, some of them are quite uh, quite rectangular in shape. But they still don't suit some of our modern machinery. So the first thing to do is understand how we can uh, maximise that. We know that that very expensive piece of machinery with very expensive chemicals um, is uh, running at 100% in the field 100% of the time. So we do something that I refer to field realignment. Um, and that's where we, uh, we square the fields up using technology and GPS. Um, uh, and we, um, we farm the internal part of the field and the external part of the field, which is whatever is left, which varies from field to field, um, can be anything from 5% uh, to 20% to total field removal. So you start, creating spaces within the farm landscape that can um can be more nature focused but back to tom's wonderful um presentation hay meadows which are the one behind me is a calcareous uh, a re recreating of a calcareous meadow that is only seven years old and fundamentally it's a uh, it's managed within agriculture because it's grazed with sheep through the winter not when the plants are in their full flowering phase. Um, and that's when we saw some of the highest amounts of, when we see the highest amounts of biodiversity, when, they're, when we farm in a sustainable environmental manner. So we start to, we, we take areas from the existing fields uh, to make our farming more efficient. And we, we, we create what we think suits that landscape. The landscape has to speak to us, understanding what it's need. If I'm in heavy Beckles series clay in South Norfolk, I'm not going to try to cultivate land for night firing catch fly, weasel snout, poppies, uh, and mayweed. 
uh, I'm actually probably going to put it down to permanent pasture or, or herb rich lays. But actually, uh, at Holcombe, where we're sandy loam over chalk, and we have some of the most amazing ray of uh, polygonums, annual weeds, we actually are going to utilize some of these areas that we've made for space um, to mimic a traditional farm landscape that allowed space for these plants that we see less of through the, through the application of herbicides. Um, initially to that, we need to understand the benefits of our hedgerows. There is, there is much hedgerows uh, in the UK as there are roads. Uh, even with the removal through government incentivization uh, post-war, um, uh, we, we, we still have a significant network of hedgerows that are uniquely English. Nowhere in the world that I've been to that I'm aware of has a net, effectively a net network of scrub covering from Cumbria to Cornwall, from Norfolk to Northumberland. And we need to, we recognize the importance of these habitats um, and everything that they, they provide. Unlike my dear friend, Charlie Burrell, who suggests that my hedges need to be nine meters wide to harbor and ha home nightingales, Norfolk hedgerows are probably best kept at about four to six meters wide. Currently, many of them aren't as wide as this, but if I'm managing a hay meadow, a species rich calcareous grassland adjacent to the hedge, which is being managed on an annual basis, I will prevent that hedgerow from becoming wider. But I don't necessarily need to cut that hedgerow, but I, I, and I can cut that uh, and I can evaluate the way I manage my hedge on a hedge by hedge, species by species basis. So I start, so I so I'm, hope I'm giving you an indication of what the, the landscape starts to look like. It starts to, we have a network of hedges that are managed in a series of ways. We have farmland that is uh, becoming more efficient by making space uh, for more environmentally focused farming systems like hay meadows or like cultivations. Um, then within the internal part of the field where we need to produce this food, we start to look at um, ways we can reduce some of the more uh, damaging effects to our environment. And the biggest uh, contributor to climate change from a farming perspective is artificial fertilizer. Um, and the wonderful Gay Brown who wrote a book called Dirt to Soil, uh, suggests that there are 32 tons of free nitrogen above every acre of land, uh, land in the world. And actually, we know through science and through um, the organic farming uh, sector that actually if we use legume crops, they can uh, capture nutrients. They can capture the atmospheric nutrients, but they can also capture um, nutrients we might apply through farmyard manure or even capture the artificial nutrients that haven't been taken up by the previous crop. Addition to this, any farmer will tell you that actually when a, when a grass lay has been in the ground for two to three years and that is then, um, that is then removed for a cereal crop or a root crop, the quality of the soil improves dramatically. It's more, it's more pliable, it's full of worms, it's full of a range of fungi and um, microbial fungi and nematodes, and it becomes more complex over time. And actually it produces very good cash crops, sugar beet, rape, wheat, beans, whatever you wish to, wish to call them. Um, so we start, what we, what we are learning through this new, uh, new system of agriculture, which is sometimes referred to as regenerative, personally I prefer to use the term restorative, actually we can start to mimic the natural world to our benefit. So we improve our soils, um, and in this process of improve our soils, strangely we start to improve the above ground biodiversity, because these legume rich uh, short term lays um, and short term can be anything from three months to 12 months to 24 to 36 months. And you start to create a new rotation within farmland without removing it from fruit production because the forage from that farm, from, that, from the center of the field can be utilized to feed livestock. And I'll come on to methane and livestock shortly before I run out of time and Annie shouts at me. Um, 
So we, uh, so we can also improve above ground biodiversity because all of these legume rich plants provide pollen and pollen provides food for pollinators, uh, you know, the easiest one are butterflies, but also bumblebees and hoverflies. Um, and we start to create a, uh, we start to create a functioning ecosystem because we're not applying broad spectrum herbicides, we're la actually allowing nature back into the fields. On the farm I referred to earlier, where we uh, started to put these, um, uh, the, these uh, catch crop cover crops in, in, in situ, we actually had a bee specialist that came and identified 11 species of bee on, uh, within the center of an arable, arable landscape when we only have 28 species of bumblebee in the UK in totality. And of course, some of them I'd never expect to find in Norfolk anyway. But it's amazing <coughs> how quickly nature can recover and high nature, not nature that is exclusive to one habitat, but nature that historically we know benefited from the farming practices. Um, so, uh, so the arable landscape starts to become a mosaic. One thing that we have lost in the landscape, <coughs> excuse me, is, uh, is scrub. Um, uh, and scrub, which is, the, which is a, a key component to rewilding. And the reason we left, we removed this scrub was through um, <coughs> the common agricultural policy, which didn't recognize scrub because farmers were only paid for piece of land that were in good agricultural condition. So we lost these, these key fragments. We've lost many of our ponds through filling them in because, they, uh, because water bodies don't meet uh, farm subsidy systems in, in their current form. So the landscape has been changed through, uh, through, through governmental incentives, uh, through uh, misunderstanding and the sidelining of nature. But I think if I look at the, way, the direction of travel, which um, we think we know the, the, the route we're on, well, <coughs> farmers will become asset managers. Farmers will look after the natural capital, their hedgerows, their soil, their water bodies, um, they, will get pay, they will get paid and recognized, and hopefully these are through the environmental land management scheme that is currently being designed by DEFRA. There will be three tiers of this. The first tier of this will be the, uh, the sustainable farming incentive, where farmers will be given a range of uh, actions at, at, at three different levels, uh, depending on their ambition, and they will basically be paid to deliver ecosystem services to be paid to deliver public goods. And we can see that seize this opportunity, if done correctly and done that each individual farmer can be ambitious at a level they feel they are content with, and they can utilize some of the principles of uh, field realignment and allowing to understand what the landscape that they are currently occupying is best suited for, whether that's permanent pasture, whether that's scrubland, whether that's water bodies, we start to create this mosaic. And this mosaic that is so important in, in British agriculture that has shaped, as Tom beautifully described, has shaped the UK landscape. Um, but I do feel there undoubtedly are spaces within the landscape for rewilding. If I look at the nature reserve, so I move away from the arable landscape and the sort of some regenerative approaches, but the nature reserve is, uh, is uh, 10,000 acres. And within that 10,000 acres, there is, uh, there's 3,000 acres of uh, freshwater grazing marsh. Uh, and that is grazed by 800 cattle. That's quite a low density. That's effectively extensive grazing. It, um, uh, uh, and within that, within that extensive grazing, it is a, uh, it's a, an abundance of biodiversity. Yes, we do lots of birds. Yes, we do breeding waders and, and lapwings and snipe and red shank. And we do spoonbills and cattle egret. Um, uh, we do, uh, we see, uh, we start to create a landscape that is diverse and um, uh, that is heterogeneic. So it's a range of different, it's a mosaic within a particular type of a farming system. And I tell everyone that the nature reserve is a farm. It's a farm that I believe is effectively sits within a rewilding system that allows space for nature and, uh, and, and produces protein. And then I'm challenged on methane. 
Um, so we're saying, so uh, I try not to be too political because I think methane is a scapegoat for fossil fuels. Um, but without, uh, I was at a meeting uh, some months ago where a member of a uh, wildlife trust said they'd done a carbon audit on their, on their, um, on their nature reserve. And actually the, the cattle that were grazing their nature reserve were emitting methane. So they were going to have to remove the cattle and look for an alternative grazier or great grazer. And actually, um, and the response from a, from a prominent member of Natural England was, if we remove the, the wildebeest from the Serengeti, we would completely change the dynamics of the landscape. But the wildebeest produced methane and methane is a natural grass. So the cattle on the nature reserve are ecosystem drivers and they are the ones that make the nature reserve as rich and diverse as it is currently. Strangely, I have brought sheep into the equation. So what we need, what we need to do is we need to know, know that this approach happens on a landscape scale. And all of the approaches that I've described, whether it's in a, a combinable, uh, in a livestock, in a, um, in a woodland, in a wetland scenario, on a coastal grazing marshes, um, we need this to go from one end of the country and it needs to be a one fits all approach. So if I look at some of the work that is currently uh, happening where farmers are starting to collaborate with, with one another, uh, the North Norfolk coast is effectively a single catchment. There are four, there are four, uh, there are a range of chalk streams within, within North Norfolk sitting on this ch chalk, chalk downland effectively what it used to be. Um, and they are the catchments, but it is just as important that the person, the farmer or the land occupier at the top of the catchment is ensuring uh, that there is a, a minimal or zero pollutions, pollutants into those waters as the person at the bottom of the catchment. So we all have to work together. We have to understand what our neighbor, the other side of the hedge is doing. If he's deciding to cut his side of the hedge, Perhaps we won't cut ours, but unless we have dialogue and understand what we are doing, we can't create landscape scale change in the in the regener regeneration uh, of our of our soils, but also our biodiversity. And I and I am of the firm belief that we will see this approach, and we will there will be winners and losers. You know where there is change, there is opportunities, but invariably you, uh, some businesses are less resilient. So we are expecting to see some. Uh, low estimates of 12% of farm businesses are, are unviable, uh, will not see transition. The National Trust puts that figure, and, and also the Duchy of Cornwall puts that figure at near a 30%, and DEFA is expecting 30% of farming businesses to, um, to, to not remain within the sector. And that gives us the opportunity. That gives us the opportunity for the next generation to hopefully look at food production systems that aren't detrimental but are beneficial to look at opportunities where we can be more imaginative and more dynamic in our approach to the way we manage our landscapes without removing their historic integrity but actually enhancing them and creating processes. The key to all farming and the key to all nature is a, a, a range of processes that happen at different lengths of times. So whether it is the hay meadow that is an annual uh, management, the grazing, the seasonal summer grazing, an annual, but the coppicing or laying of a hedge that might be 5, 10, 15, 20 years, depending on the species, all the car coppiced within, uh, coppiced at 25 to 30 years rotation. Uh, the creation of scrapes, where you then allow a process to develop. There's a wonderful example at Holcomb where someone created a scrape for a, uh, for, a, um, for avocets, which were currently in a very, very low population. That scrape now is, is a, produced some of the highest densities of natterjack toads in the country. And in due course, that will become full of reed and club brush and will become ideal nesting for marsh harriers. So we need to start these processes and let them develop. All of the ponds that the Norfolk Ponds projects do across Norfolk, looking to do uh, in excess of 100 this autumn, actually kickstarts processes. That start again yeah and some people are challenged what they're doing because as the original mile pit was done dug and then has become a pond and then has come scrubbed up and dried out actually some would say 
that's a process do we need to start and these are some of the challenges of uh Oh, and the dialogues between what is right and what is wrong. There is no right and there is no wrong. But what there is, is understanding where we need to allow and make space for nature in all that we do. Great, thank you so much, Jake. It's always fascinating to hear about what's going on at Holcomb. And again, there are questions that are coming through now um, and I'll put those to you at the end of the session after we've heard from Dom. Um, so our final speaker today is um, Dominic Bussell. Um, Dom actually joined us yesterday evening for a Greenbuild event where he recounted the story of Wild Ken Hill um, and he interested and inspired many uh, people um, when he talked about the work that was going on there. So for those of you who haven't yet met Dom, he is the founder and project manager of Wild Ken Hill, where he established the rewilding side of the overall project. Um, Dom also leads on external uh, engagements and collaborations with other organisations and is keen to explore the benefits of the approach that's been taken at Wild Ken Hill. So without further ado, over to you, Dom. Thank you very much, Annie, for the kind introduction. Um, and really, thank you again to everyone for, for coming to, 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 to attend the event today. Um, I'm extremely flattered and humbled to be um, talking alongside two genuine and real experts in their field who um, have made both inc incredibly um, compelling and fascinating talks. So, you know, thank you for having me alongside um, those two guys. I think what I, what I, what I will try to do today, and I, I, I presented last night for the Greenbuild event, which I think has been great, um, about the story, you know, of our project. Um, I know there'll be people here today who who, who weren't uh, weren't there yet, so I'm going to recount a bit of that. Uh, but I'll try and I'll try and sort of talk to it from the lens um, of, of of landscapes of change, and and I'll, and also to think about um, all of which has been said before me by by Tom and Jake. Um, let me just quickly get my my screen my screen. Annie, will you let me know if you're, which one you're seeing? Yes, yeah, that's uh, perfect. That's We've cool. got your Great. opening screen. Perfect. Um, I, I do want you. I'm afraid I don't quite have as many slides as Tom, but uh, as someone who used to work in consulting, I find it much much easier to communicate with them. So I've got, I've got a few which I'll which I'll walk you through. Um, I think the, the first thing uh, is just to remind you. So this is this is where we are at Ken Hill. Um, um, the, the, this is where the, the Wild Ken Hill project, I suppose, takes place. Um, we, we began this project for many of the reasons that have been mentioned before, um, because we do recognize that there are huge challenges uh, environmentally, um, you know, the interconnected challenge of, of, of mitigating and reversing climate change and that, and that of our biodiversity decline, uh, but also that of continuing to produce food uh, for, a, for a, a growing global population, one whose diet is, is rapidly changing. Um, um, you know, we, we find ourselves in a, in a you know, um, myself, my, 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 my dad and, and, and those who work on our team, you know, extremely motivated to, to try and address those challenges. Um, and we also, I, I think, and, and, and this is something that I think Jake alluded to, but, but uh, yeah, I'll try and flesh out a bit more. The, 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 the part of the reason for the, the Wild Ken Hill project coming, coming to existence and, and I think part of the reason more broadly is as to why we will actually see, uh, you know, landscapes really quite, really changing quite dramatically in the next five to 10 years um, is, is also because of the, the, the huge change in, um, in policy setting that land managers and farmers find themselves in. Um, so on, under the common agricultural policy uh, you, that, we were, that we were sort of, um, you, you know, um, incentivized by for the last 30, 40 years, we were, um, you know, we were we were incentivized to to to, to produce, to 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 grow, to farm marginal land, um, and to and to grow, almost grow as much as we could. We were we were paid on a per acre basis, and that's totally changing. So, you know, Ken Hill, um, you know, we're not in the twelve or thirty percent of farms that, that Jake alluded to um, that, that 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 aren't viable with, without that subsidy. Um, but in a bad farm year, and, and you know, one comes around every so often when the weather and the commodity prices go against you. Um, you know, our farm probably wouldn't make money without that subsidy. 
So, you know, one of the reasons for our, our little mini landscape of, of change that we've got going at Ken Hill is commercial alongside our, alongside our, 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 our strong desire to do something about the, the, those, those huge challenges, which Tom and Jake covered in, in great detail. I think what, I, what I'll try and talk to you now, and I'll, I'll, I might spend a bit of time on this slide, is, is the, the thinking and rationale uh, behind the, 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 the Wild Ken Hill project, and, and in particular, the way that we have thought about um, using different land management techniques, different tools uh, across our site. Um, I think the first thing to say is that, um, you know, I, 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 sh I think I share you know, in common, pretty much every view expressed by, by Tom and Jake. Um, we, we thought extremely hard about, um, you know, how we would go about this project um, and whether rewilding, you know, which is a word and I agree, um, you know, would be appropriate land management tool uh, in, in, in this part of our site. Um, you know, and I think, in fact, some of Tom's work was used to support the, the idea that it would be a good um, a good location for a rewilding project that the, the, the part of Ken Hill that we are putting into that system um, and one you know Natural England is, is, is a, a part of DEFRA and, and one of their roles is, to, is to, to, to create partnerships with land managers like us and support us do this sort of work well, you know one of the reasons that they are so supportive of, of our project is, is because of the, the work Tom put in uh, showing which, which I think that showed that the rewilding approach or the heavy rewilding approach, as, as, as Tom called it, uh, in that orange area at Ken Hill, would actually do uh, would actually create a great deal of benefit not only to our environment but also to the sort of historic, you know, returning somewhat the historical landscape that we had there, a mixture of of, of woodland pasture and heath. Um, we we put about twenty five percent of of the land area at Ken Hill into a rewilding scheme. That's, that's the orange area, I hope it's clear, in the middle of the slide. 50% um, of that comes from ex arable uh, and, a, and a few um, kind of grazing meadows, but mostly ex arable And the other 50% um, comes from woodland. And really the focus, I suppose, that the real, the, the, the fastest and most interesting change ecologically, at least we'll see, will be in the ex arable. Um, now, I think, you know, Tom and Jay both made some really interesting points about the, you know, where, where this should be done. And I'll, I'll try and explain our thinking. So these, these parts, from a, from, a, from a productivity and a macro perspective, this part of Ken Hill is our, our, our by far and away our least productive. And the soil here is incredibly poor for farming. Um, you know, there are some parts of it where, you know, if, if, if you had a really bad experience with black grass, You'd be lucky to get out, you know, what you put in in terms of in terms of the the seed, um, um, and we we were constantly achieving very very low, um, well under average yields there, um, and in the meantime, doing quite a lot of environmental damage. I mentioned black grass, but you know, the more of it we were getting down there, the more we felt we needed to spray, the more chemicals we were applying to the land to, to generate that yield, which ultimately, um, you know, was not. Was, 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 not was not worthwhile. Um, and, and that was a part of the farm where, you know, without that, in, that uh, EU subsidy, um, you know, it was not profitable. Uh, and I mean, and that for me, is a pretty clear, you know, market, market, market indicator that that's probably not what you should be doing with that piece of land. Um, and I agree that, and, and I hope it's evident from the slide, uh, that rewilding is, is not a panacea at all. Um, it's not a one size fits all approach. You have, you have to do it really carefully. Um, and so it is just it is just 25 percent of what we're doing. But critically, um, you know, it's, it's next to an area of of freshwater marsh, um, you know, a much, a, you know, much smaller, but similar in nature to, to that at, that Jake was describing at Holcomb. And we're doing our bit to try and get the biodiversity there to, to, to a similar level. Um, you know, we've not put that into a, into a rewilding scheme because, um, you know, for some of the reasons Tom mentioned, I, I, I think it would be totally inappropriate. Um, you would probably see the, uh, the, 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 the succession of vegetation taking place there, you know, would take away from the existing species use, um, you know, which does cover some really exciting botany, um, great inverts, as, as well as the, 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 
the wading birds um, and, and the, the egrets and spoonbills that we're starting to, starting to turn up there as well. I think that would have all gone backwards. We would have lost a lot of that under a rewilding approach. We would have seen succession of probably bramble and hedgerow species and scrub, uh, influx of predators, uh, and we would, have, we would have lost our sward. It would have been crowded out, lost our pasture to that scrub. And I, I think it, I think it would, would have been inappropriate. So we there, we, we follow a, a traditional conservation approach. Um, and I, I don't mean traditional in the, in the way that Tom meant it. I mean, it really referring to the last 50 years where, you know, a, a nature reserves across the country followed a, um, a very active management approach, spending lots of time, money, money and effort managing reserves for, for very specific outcomes. Um, and I would contrast that to the rewilding approach, which uh, for me, maybe I'll come back to this in a minute, but for me, it's very process focused, not outcome focused. And, and of course it's passive. Um, I suppose the other thing I, I wanted to mention about our, our rewilding area is, um, I suppose what we're, what we're trying to do is, yes, yeah, so I think we do, we do, we do buy in to, to, an, to an extent the idea that um, the removal of human interventions um, can lead to really good biodiversity outcomes. But we are totally cognizant of the fact that we are in this lived land, you know, lived landscape, you know, um, full of the impacts of, of humans. Um, you know, we, you know, including the, the many muntjac that we have in the rewilding area, the rhododendron that still persists. And so I suppose our approach, our, 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 our interpretation of the rewilding word and our application of it in this area um, is really to, to maximise or to minimise the interventions with, within the practical constraints of, of, of achieving some really, really exciting stuff from a biodiversity perspective, from a carbon sequestration perspective. So this is in its own way a managed, a managed system. Uh, it, it, it involves the management of numbers of grazing animals it involves the control of deer uh, and a, a few other small interventions that we will never be able to, to 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 let go of and that we will continue to do because we we understand our our scale we understand our context and we, we understand that um you know by, by undertaking those interventions we'll actually achieve better outcomes I think the third, the third thing that we're doing at Kenhill uh, is, 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 is regenerative farming. Um, we're trying to do it you know, much in the way that, that Jake described. Um, we are trying to grow really good amounts, you know, comparable amounts of food as we were before from that, out, from that land, um, if not better in the future, uh, amounts of food, whilst also regenerating or restoring our, our soils, sort of to, you know, pick the word that you like best, um, and what we're finding well, as, we, as we do that um, is, of course, this, this, this extensive array of, of, of benefits uh, alongside the food production itself. Um, you know, we are storing carbon, uh, sequestering carbon, I should say, uh, in our soils each year. Um, if you were to look at the, uh, the net GHG footprint of our farm each year, um, it is likely to be negative. Um, we are, you know, and that's also because we are not using as much machinery going up and down, burning diesel. We're not using anywhere near as much, you know, nitrogen-based fertilizers as we were before. Um, we are also experiencing huge growth in farmland biodiversity. Um, we, you know, our, our ecologist on site, you know, will if he's surveying, he's just as happy to go into a margin or a field of barley and use a sweep net to have a look at what's in there as, as he is in the rewilding area. Now, undoubtedly, we're going to see probably a higher high potential in that rewilding area. Um, you know, the way that system is managed is, is, is probably going to lead to better to biodiversity outcomes than on the farm. But it is still really, really impressive in the farm. I mean, walking through there, sometimes it, it does feel a bit of a nature reserve. Um, Stone curlew attempted to breed there this year, lapwing skylark or, or breeding in the in the in the in, in the fields themselves, and then amazing hetero species, you know, yellow hammers and linnets. It's 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 crawling with biodiversity, and we absolutely love that about it. I think another thing that that's exciting about the the regenerative farming side, um, and again, you know, topical 
um, is the way that it, it holds water. Um, you know, we've, we're, we're running in one field across, across uh, in the site. We're running a, we split the field in half, literally straight down the middle. And in one side, we are practicing um, our, our kind of newer style uh, way of, 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 of cultivating the land, which is to minimize disturbance. Um, and use things like strip tills, where, where you just create a tiny little slit, uh, one inch in every three to, to, to establish your seed and direct drills. Um, comparing that with a, with a traditional uh, cult set of cultivations, which, you know, plowing, pressing, subsoiling, all those, those, those traditional things. We, uh, every other pass, every other application in that field is identical apart from the cultivations. Um, and we do water infiltration tests on those quite regularly. Um, you know, we do them when it's dry and when it's wet, and the result is, is usually the same. The, um, the, the side that's under the regenerative type of cultivations obviously um, accepts water much, much quicker. Uh, the, the root structure, the profile of the soil uh, allows it to accept water much, much quicker. Uh, we also have nodes that we have we, we, we have in the soil at various depths, I think 30, 60, 90 centimetres. Shows us that actually the water holding capacity of that soil, um, you know, on the regenerative side is, is substantially higher now, uh, even after just, just two years of running this, this trial side by side. I mean, and that's important for a number of reasons. Firstly, because um, we, we're, we're going we're gonna to be experiencing much less runoff into our water courses. Um, and yes, there's, you know, a huge problem from, uh, well, I, I mean, loosely speaking, I think, you know, about 40% from agriculture, 60% from homes is, is, is the, 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 the breakdown of nutrients that we find in our, in our water courses. So yes, we, we've got a real problem with, with, with homes and sewage, but also agriculture has, has a part to play. Um, and we, we like to think that this style of farming is, is massively reducing the amount that comes off Ken Hill and ends up in the amount of nutrients in water courses. Um, and the fourth thing, which I, in a way might be the most important of all uh, it, when, when we look back at this, um, is that we've, we're finding this, this style of farming to be more profitable. Um, as I said, our yields, we're three years in, um, you know, we might have seen a bit of a drop off versus where we were before. Um, I would say that's because we're, we're, doing, we're doing something quite quickly in, in, a, in a degenerated soil. Um, but those yields, they're still very comparable with our neighbors. Um, and we think as we restore our soils, they're, they're, they're likely to go up. Um, we have experienced a much, much faster decrease in our, in our variable costs. We don't spend anything really on, we've applied no insecticide, no fungicide, and barely any herbicide this year. Uh, we've cut our fertilizer applications by half already in three years, and we, we think we'll cut the other half in the next three years. Um, and in the first year alone, on our fixed costs, we saved, you know, 80k on by not ploughing and, and and actually performing other types of of, of establishing our, our crops. So um, it's more profitable. It's more profitable for farmers to farm this way in uh, this regenerative way um, on so on average soils like ours. We think it's much more profitable, and that could actually, I think, make the difference as we see as we see farmers and land managers across the country go. Oh, you know, oh, oh, bugger, my, my subsidies are really starting to fall away now, as they have um, for the first time last this year. Um, you know, how am I going to think about um, my business, my enterprise? Um, can I look at changing things? And one of the things we're, we're trying hard to do at Ken Hill is to show that this actually is, is a really viable alternative and, and that it's a win-win it's a for both nature um, and for you as, as a land manager. I suppose um, that's, the, that's, that's taking a look at each of the, the three parts of our approach. And what I like to think is, um, you know, it's, 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 it's relatively crude. You know, we've, 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 we've put a rewilding area in our poorest soils, we're farming our best soils, um, and we haven't rewilded an area where, you know, that would have actually gone backwards from a biodiversity perspective, and we still, we still practice that traditional conservation. So it is, it is, you know, it is quite straightforward. We're thinking really about two dimensions. How good is your soil and what's the existing species use? Um, but actually by using that quite, 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 quite basic approach, um, we, we, we've come up with something where we're practicing 
all three things side by side. And we think we're really one of the only places in the country doing that. Um, and we're delivering a mix of outcomes uh, and, and, and goods, which we think um, is the right one for this day and age that, that we need. There is, you know, very good amounts of, of, of healthy, nutritious food being produced here. There is also lots of carbon being stored. There is also a restoration of our native biodiversity. Um, there are lots of, you know, permissive paths and areas for people to access green space. Um, about three or 400 acres is, is, is of permissive access. Um, and all the benefits that's going to provide in terms of mental well-being and reduced costs to the NHS. Um, so we think this is a, a land model, a, a landscape that is scaled up across England um, and, may, and across lowland UK. Um, you know, the way that it has put rewilding in a place where we think it should be and, and not treating it as a panacea, but as part of a, a bigger whole, uh, a, a connector, um, something to, to, you know, join up the dots. We think that is really powerful and we're, 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 we're proud that we've, we've, we've come up with something like this um, with just our small team, um, you know, thinking, of, you know, three years ago, thinking about how we were going to, how we were going to change the way we manage land. Um, I hope that's been um, helpful in, you know, in, in look at how rewilding regenerative farming can be put into practice, how they can work side by side, working with nature and not against it um, to bring about changing landscapes that, that I think we need. And with that, I'd be de delighted to get into the Q&A, which I know will be hotly anticipated and, and hope to comment alongside some great questions along, alongside uh, Jake and Tom. That's great. Thank you, Dom. Um, and uh, I know I said this last night, but it is amazing to hear about how much work has happened at Ken Hill in just two years. Um, so thank you once again for that. Um, so uh, Jake and Tom, if you um, are able to unmute and put your cameras back on. Um, I'll just wait for Tom. Are you there, Tom? There he is. Brilliant. Um, so we've got quite a few questions that have come in and I've got them sort of on one of my screens. Um, so I'm gonna have a look at those in a minute. Before we start, um, I'm gonna ask one of my own questions. Um, and I am, I am slightly playing devil's advocate here, so, so do bear with me. Um, so I'm gonna put this question to you, Tom, first, um, but then um, Jake and Dom, do please jump in. So um, Tom, you talked um, a lot about sort of the eradication of history in the landscape and sort of how our histories are, our, our landscape has so much cultural significance. I suppose my question is that sort of in the face of catastrophic biodiversity loss and, climate change does that really matter and that's my question to you Tom uh, yeah um, I think it does and I don't I, and I think the answer to your question has really come from uh, from Dominic and from Jake uh, Dominic in particular I mean it seems to me that that model for targeting areas for well how do I like to use the phrase rewilding but but pulling the the, your foot off the accelerator a bit, targeting those, farming in the kind of regenerative way that, that Jake's been discussing, and in certain areas following traditional land management principles, um, does achieve the end. I mean, I, I think the answer is the countryside is for a lot of different things. And we don't have a lot of countryside. And we've got to think hard how we make different bits work for it. And I think that kind of, of, of solution at Ken Hill uh, is, is, is great. And, and I think to roll that one out does meet all the targets. It, it, it shouldn't be an and or. My objection to, isn't to rewilding per se. It's to the kind of obsessive rewilding, which is pushed by some people, as if all other aspects of landscape, land management don't matter. So I, I don't think there's a, I don't think there is a, a, a in a sense, we're not answering your question because I don't need to, because there are ways of dealing of, with managing land so you get all the benefits. I don't know whether the other two agree with that. I guess Dominic and Jake probably would. I think it's a, I, th I think it's a right tree, right place, right beaver, right river. 
That's as simple as that. That's very um, concise. I, I I don't have much to add. I, I I'm I'm totally in unison. I think it's all about it's all about where you're doing these things and not. We we never wanted it to be a, a, a the rewilding approach to be a, a panacea. Uh, it, it, I've, and I've, I've always used that word actually prior to today that is ex as one I, I really wanted to avoid. Um, I, I didn't get too much into our, you know, into how we do it. Um, I, I think we're we're on the, the of the Tom spectrum. We're on the kind of rewilding heavy side. Um, but I but I you know I'm 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 in chorus with with the other guys. Thank you. Okay, so. Um... We've got a question that's come in. Um, it's, it's, it's specifically for you, Jake, but I think that Dom and Tom will probably have a view on this as well. Um, so it, the question is, so do you think that the environmental land management schemes that replace the common agricultural policy will incentivize better management of today's landscapes? So Jake, I'll give that to you first and then we'll go to Dom and to Tom or however you want to, to go about that. So, uh... So the, so we have a we had a referendum. Uh, we decided the the population by a very small majority decided to remove themselves from the largest um, the largest marketplace adjacent to it. Uh, and uh, we when we left that we left the or we also removed ourselves from the common agricultural policy uh, policy which supported farmers for occupying land. Um, uh, we then had a paper called the Health and Harmony paper, which was a, uh, a discussion with stakeholders, mainly farmers, landowners, ENGOs, etc., on how we were going to fund farmers. Um, and Gavin Ross, who uh, is, uh, works for DEFRA, sort of coordinated this. And he was uh, paying farmers to deliver services, which is great. Um, the issue we have currently is we have something called, we have another government department called the Treasury. And UK uh, English farmers receive 1.7 billion in farm support. And there's an indication that they might reduce the level of that support um, with the environmental land management schemes. And if I look at it, and I'm currently, I've got one of the Holcomb farms has entered into a pilot for the sustainable farming incentive, which is the lower tier of the, uh, the three main uh, core ambitions of uh, environmental land management. Um, and it's rather depressingly unambitious. It's only asking to do a percentage of your farm. You know, everything that I'm about is it's a whole farm approach. It's the center of the field, ensuring the soil is good, ensuring that there's biodiversity in the center of the field, that the natural capital assets being maintained and managed in a way that are rich for biodiversity. Um, and actually the current scheme is, is broad and shallow, which was requested by many, but it's also lacks ambition. And I think in its current form, uh, I am nervous, but I think it will be challenged. And I'm, I'm of the firm belief there will be change. I mean, I, 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 I sort of see, um, I see the, 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 the part of Elm that Jake mentioned, SFI, the bottom tier, the, the, the bit that's for most farmers, uh, you know, as, as quite unambitious too. I think that it is probably the, the primary legislation that, we've, that we're seeing, the Agriculture Act and the Environment Bill, which, we've, which should have been enacted a long time ago, which is hopefully very soon. Um, you know, I think, I, I, I think a, a great, and I, I'm fully behind the philosophy of public money for public goods delivered by land managers. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, I do, I, I think the, the SFI is, is not good enough. You know, we looked at our farm um, and we, we, we over, we're well overqualified for it. So, you know, um, we're not gonna be spreading our approach with, with that incentive. Um, I think the thing that I find potentially more, you know, um, that I'm potentially more nervous about is the way that it's not joined up. It doesn't seem to be joined up with other parts of government policy, in particular with our foreign policy, um, because it's sort of, you know, I'm not the first farmer to say this, but it, it just doesn't make sense to, um, on the one hand, try to um, improve our environmental standards of food production, whilst also 
uh, exposing us to competition with 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 markets um, under free trade agreements where those standards are lower. Um, because I, I suspect we'll just end up seeing it's probably small but but important increases to the amount of food we import and in turn will be you know exploiting some of those negative externalities so that we're not actually doing any good outside of outside of or globally we're not we're not doing any good so that's that sort of where i i you know i really welcomed the 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 headline the headlines of the two main pieces of legislation um and i and i've I've been sad to see that I that I I think what's happened is it's it's some of it's been eroded behind closed doors, um, and I, I really hope that between now and when Elm is live in 2024, um, that we get it we can get it back on track and joined up with with other government departments. Thanks, Dom and Tom. Have you got anything on that uh, that you want to add at all? Well, I mean, the only thing I was going to say was what Dominic just said. I think the the the, the problem is, I mean. I, I don't trust this government as far as I could fit. <laughs> um, and I think it's the level of the inability to do joined up thinking. And I think the that that the, the the point Dominic raised about are doing deals which effectively threaten the profitability of environmentally friendly farming in this country is is a major issue. The only other thing I would say was that although the um, Elms, you know, there's a lot, a lot of good stuff, you know, a lot to recommend it. Uh, obviously, from my particular point of view, I feel the agenda on land management is 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 good on biodiversity issues but isn't particularly interested or sufficiently interested in kind of cultural historical value uh, i think uh, that's the fault of 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 us i mean it just seems to me that that the people in in uh, uh natural history natural scientists conservation have got their act together much much better than people in my line of work and they're more influential but the main point i was going to agree with dominic yeah great Thank you, Jake. Did you raise your hand? Yeah. So, so just it, it, so I do. So the Elm will incentivize better management of hedgerows. Uh, it will incentivize big land put aside, um, and it will do all this. Possibly not at a level that uh, uh, is sufficient. And Defra will announce. We now think it's more December rather than January. There will be a new payment rates will come out. Um, but actually, the future is blended finance. The future is uh, is government uh, and uh, and private finance working together. Everything that is being talked about in Glasgow is all about the, the corporates and um, investments and pension funds that have a significant amount of money. The Prince of Wales uh, a couple of weeks ago um, is a huge fan of, of this new form of mechanising and paying for for climate change um, adaptation and for uh, species loss, because governments have billions, but um, corporations and, uh, and pension funds have trillions. And Jeff Bezos today has just announced three billion towards uh, uh, species uh, species um, uh, creation. Um, so actually, big figures are now being mentioned. So I think actually we mustn't be fixated with the historic purse that paid us, or we must look for alternative forms of income. Great, thank you. Um, and so we've got other questions that have come in and I'm gonna sort of condense them into, into one question, hopefully. Um, and um, Tom, I'm gonna ask you first, but then again, um, Jake and Dom, please please do um, do chip in. Um, so we've got, a couple of questions so so one of them is about sort of the reintroduction of, of beavers in the Norfolk landscape and sort of what your views are on that but I, I suppose in that as well it'd be interesting to know kind of what your views are on the reintroduction of apex predators um obviously it's been it's been done in Europe with some success um so why is that not appropriate for for this landscape um so yeah there's a couple of things there but I think you get my drift yeah I do um <clears throat> I, I, on the first one, the beaver, I'm really not the right person to, to talk to. I mean, it's been so long gone that um, it, I, my, my feeling is that it's, if there are demonstrable benefits for introducing it, those have to be balanced against impacts on, 
on other aspects of the environment and on the practicality of farming. Uh, and so I've got no strong views on that one. In terms of alpha predators, well, I do have quite strong views on this, um, partly because there's a, a, a fairly long tradition in historical writing for suggesting that um, the whole business of the wolf, for example, being a threat to humanity has all been exaggerated and overdone. Uh, and we published in, you mentioned our journal Rural History, we've published a good paper a few years back about the wolf in northern Italy in the 16th and 17th century, which has some wonderful well-documented cases of wolves coming into churches and massacring large chunks of the population. My own view on reintroducing the wolf is it will be fine until the first, first baby disappears. Um, and I do not do not think that if it does happen, it's going to happen in Norfolk. I really, really can't see that at all uh, possibly in scotland or somewhere but i i'm 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 very very doubtful and and i i think in a sense it may be missing the point um again it, it, it we have to think about the landscape as a place where people live and have lived it has to have human uh, interaction built into it and i think the kind of rewilding that we've heard about at ken hill you know that's fine that works that's in a sense as as, as dominic said continuing the historical traje trajectory a lot of that land was uh, heathland and wood pasture you now it fits in well the idea of doing dramatic big showy things reintroduce the bee re the, the, i'm not sure that really hits where we need to be at in a county like norfolk Great, thanks, Tom. Uh, Jake and Dom, if you want to come in at all. Um, well, I, I mean, taking those two things in turn. So, I mean, on the beavers, I think in some, I, I, I do believe there are demonstrable and wide benefits from from having that animal back in the wild, across England. And I, I think it will happen. Um, and as long as we have the tools to manage those those animals properly, and they they will need managing um, to mitigate some of the downsides, I think I think that's a, that's a really good thing. Um, I think the discussion around apex predators, in particular wolves, um, bear, and lynx, it I think it is missing the point. To a bit. I, I think, except for a for, for a, a, a quite a marginal fringe, um, there aren't actually that many people proposing this stuff, especially in in Norfolk and Lowland England. Um, the lynx will probably happen in my lifetime. Uh, maybe the wolf, and, and probably not the bear. Um, I'm still in my 20s for, for, for reference. Um, and I think at what you know what people like me and other you know other people in you know who are, who are pushing for more sites, you know, rewilding sites like ours, you know, that, that that's not what we're that's not what we're proposing. We're we're proposing for managed systems, you know, with people, you know, deeply involved in them, uh, you know, uh helping, you know, as ecologists, as as foresters um as volunteers as managers um and uh i i think you know someone said this much more eloquently with me recently but it, it those those sorts of you know debates actually really detract from our message they make us look quite you know we get tired with that brush and we look we look silly and vociferous um and i i i try to avoid um uh, you know those sorts of conversations essentially Great, thanks. And Jake, I don't know if you've got anything else to add to that at all. Oh, I've always got something to add, Annie. <laughs> um, so, so predation is a natural thing. We mustn't. We there's been an obsession with uh, humanity that uh, it only allows itself to be the apex predator and not others, so that we can harvest for ourselves. You know, we have a we have a, a breeding colony of uh, cormorants that are. Uh, uh, not necessarily the fisherman's favorite friend because they're a predator to fish. Um, uh, in my time in Norfolk, so 30 years, close to 30 years in Norfolk, I have seen the increase of apex predator um, go through the roof. I've seen you know, red kites, buzzards, marsh harriers, um, uh, uh, kestrels, you know, so all of these species I've seen increases in. Um, because the habitat was right and the habitat is suited. Um, you know, it wasn't that long ago that marsh harriers were on the verge of extinction. This year we had 12 pairs of marsh harriers, 12 nests, uh, produced 12 young. 
So, and there was a balance there. There was sufficient food availability. Um, and yes, yeah, some made it and some did it, didn't. And that's just how the natural work, world works. It's not always successful. So I'm a, I'm a, um, a, a, I'm a fan of letting, creating the habitat that is fit for purpose and, and letting things move and in, in develop and uh, uh, being, uh, finding a, a place for themselves within the landscape. Can I have one question for Tom? The wonderful slide of open, open um, uh, downland in Norfolk that you, you put in. Um, so would you have an objection to removing the enclosure at hedgerows to recreate that downland landscape? You're on mute. That's because I was thinking. That's a very, very difficult question. I, I think in certain circumstances, the answer would probably be yes. I'd be uneasy about it, to be absolutely honest. But there is, it, it, I wouldn't rule it out. I mean, I think the, the, the difficult thing about history uh, and the landscape is it tells you what happened. It doesn't, it doesn't, it kind of doesn't tell you what to do, but it informs you broadly on that. Um, it would depend on the context. I mean, you were talking about Holcomb and the and and the field pattern there. I mean, that's most wonderful intact example, as you were saying, of a late eighteenth, early nineteenth century field pattern. I think I, I I always think that the main changes you can make of the kind you've just talked about are in places where the landscape has been pretty badly damaged. So if you had a situation where the hedgerows were kind of, hadn't been maintained, they were gappy, they were kind of going anyway. And many of those late enclosure hedgerows, basically Hawthorne aren't, you know, that durable. They're not like those big mixed medieval ones. Then possibly in certain circumstances, yes, but it would be a difficult one. You know, you'd have to think, I think all this stuff is difficult. I mean, I think the three of us can agree on that. It's difficult and needs a lot of thought. Um, and it's the balances which, uh, which we all, well, I say we, you two deal with in a practical sense. I mean, I'm just ivory towers, but it is that balance that's hard. Great, thank you. Um, and so we've got, um, some other questions that have come in sort of about local farming community and how to sort of get them involved in this agenda if they haven't if they haven't yet engaged in it um i suppose one of the questions that that i'm sorry i'm just looking over here at one of my other screens um is saying about um smaller estates in in um norfolk and uh, and smaller farmers um so so how how do they engage with 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 this kind of the regenerative agricultural debate, the kind of move towards managing landscapes for biodiversity. How, how do we engage with those communities? Um, I'm gonna put that question to Dom first and then um, Jake and Tom do chip in if you want to. Um, <clears throat> well, I, th I think um, the first thing to say is that I think you know, everyone can do something, you know, both, both inside and outside of our sector. Um, I think, you know, let's take them in turn. So the, the type of farming that we're doing and, and, and Jake talked about, um, you know, that's not something, you know, that's dictated by scale. You know, most, most people can have a go at that, you know, tenant farmers of different size, um, you know, larger states, you know, like Holcomb. Um, that's, you know, that, that, that's the barriers to entry to that aren't that high. In fact, they're lower than conventional systems because you need less equipment. Um, I think, you know, the rewilding, I think there's a case to say that, um, you know, that is probably harder to access. Um, but I, I think, you know, at least the type that we're doing, um, you know, ultimately it, it works best at scale. And as I said, it, it, it's not going to be appropriate in many places and it shouldn't be done in many places. I think what I would add is that, um, of course, as a word, um, it has really, you know, touched a lot of people. Um, I think, you know, Isabella Tree's book about NEP has, last time I checked, it sold well over 200,000 copies. Um, it's entered a lot of people's hinterland. Um, and there is, you know, you know, a, a good and I, you know, a great grassroots thing around rewilding, rewilding, you know, road verges and 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 council commons and and school playgrounds. Um, 
great. You know, I don't, I'm not going to say, oh, don't use that word. And, and, you know, that's not what it is and, and get in the way of that. I, you know, that's all fantastic. Uh, and I, I, I think one of the great things about that, the, you know, that word and that, that book is that it has, it has, it has provided a story of hope and it has encouraged so many people to get involved, uh, both in, in and outside of our sector. Um, I know Jake will have more eloquent views on the, on the farm side of things. So, so I, th I think Dom's absolutely right. We can all do it at whatever level we feel suits our, our business. Um, uh, and I think rewild, rewilding Britain suggests that you have to have so many thousand acres before you have a viable unit to establish the principles of what they're promoting. Um, interestingly, everyone's called it rewilding, but Isabella was and I've spoken to on this, on the, the, the name that evokes so much passion, both for and against, incidentally, um, uh, that actually she used the word, word wilding rather than rewilding specifically, so as not to say she was trying to recreate something that wasn't there. So I think that, that's, that is key. Um, but I, it's, you know, back to what Tom you know, talked, how we manage our hedges, how we can recreate hay meadows, how can we can make our grasslands more interesting? Actually, we know that creates high value nature. So we can all do our bit. We can all do, you know, I must admit, my garden is lawns and hedges and I cut them like a bowling green because I think I work on a bigger landscape elsewhere. Um, uh, so, um, but, but, but we can, we, you know, I did leave a small corner to make it a bit more interesting where I, I left it uncut. And I, you know, so we can all do our bit in, in whatever way. So, and each bit makes a difference. And that creates the connectivity that is required through the landscape. Great, thank you. And that's very honest, Jake. <laughs> um, um, so, no, go on, Tom, sorry. No, I was just going to say, it's with those small, <coughs> smaller units where rewilding on the Ken Hill model isn't really viable that the way people have bought into the buzzword most concerns me. And I'll, I'll give you an example, an anecdote. I won't mention anybody or anybody's name, but I went to a couple of years back, wonderful farm in mid Norfolk, uh, hedges intact, lovely meadows managed, a couple of areas of ancient woodland, uh, some of it being coppiced. There were pollarded trees, there were a lot of trees and timber, and it was just, the kind of landscape which was butchered across much of Norfolk in the in the second half of the 20th century. And I was talking to the people and we were discussing it. And uh, the, uh, the the owner's wife turned to me and said, of course, we're thinking of doing re of going into rewilding. And I thought, what? why would you want to with all that's being delivered here not simply in terms of biodiversity but in terms of history cultural landscape sense of place and the rest and 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 that's i think if i seem a little anti uh, some aspects of rewilding it's experiences like that which which do it that that it it's it's the sort of acceptance that it is of itself a good when in many contexts it probably isn't and that would be an, an example and i do think that is a problem with smaller units because because the more we emphasize rewilding the more that can't be done really on the kind of um a dominant level of things so the more the rewilding they would do is actually likely i think to be a net loss or potentially could be a net loss Okay, thanks, Tom. That's really interesting. And and last time I checked, you weren't clairvoyant. But um, just just if just some thoughts on what do landscapes of the future look like? Um, you know, what what are kind of the things that you can see coming forward in the next 10, 20 years? Um, I know that's that's quite a big, broad question. But Tom, what are your thoughts? It's at this stage, Annie, I always say historians study the past with the worst people to ask about the future, by definition. I don't know. I really don't know because there are so many unknowables. I think potentially we are, we may be at a good point. 
I mean, I'm naturally optimistic. And I think having lived through the, the dreadful 60s and 70s and into the early 80s, where things really were dire. When I first came to Norfolk in 1984, they were still bulldozing hedges, you know, without a thought. Uh, and and so things have got better. I think with the kind of initiatives that we've just heard uh, from from Jake and Dominic, you know, those could be rolled out more. They wouldn't even need to be rolled out everywhere. They just need to be rolled out more. I think it would transform the landscape in in really good ways. So I, I, I but against that, against that, there are bigger issues. One is the danger which which Dominic alluded to, that some of this stuff gets potentially watered down by a lack of joined up thinking on other aspects of government policy arising ultimately from, from, from the Brexit situation and the need to do more deals. And then the bigger issue of climate change uh, and how that will impact. And we've heard, we've touched on that, you know, in bits and pieces, but climate change other aspects of globalization. I mean, the one that terrifies me is um, in Norfolk, uh, if you go back into the 1930, 20th century, 90% of the farmland trees were elm, ash and oak. Elm is now gone. Ash, I don't think is going to go, but it's certainly not doing very well. All we need is someone else coming in to take out oak and that really will be terrible. And so one of the things you need to think about is diversifying diversifying planting and sorry I will finish and I'm monopolizing but one of the things you can learn from history is you can see things like oak ash elm were dominant does that mean history tells us they should always be dominant no what history tells us there were reasons why they were dominant which was essentially economic reasons so we no longer have to think about those we can have other priorities so we should be diversifying countryside planting using you know hornbeam black poplar, whatever. Um, but in terms of in terms of the overall answer, I don't know because I don't know how many horrors are coming down the road, but I'm by nature optimistic and I think we're going in potentially in the right direction. Thanks, Tom. Um, and Jake and Dom, I don't know if you want to come in on that at all. I walked I walked to Woodland with uh, Rob Fuller many years ago and we looked at the effects of ash dieback on this ash heavy woodland and we looked at the as the canopy opened we looked at the species that were starting to colonize inside a semi-ancient woodland and we saw uh hawthorn and we saw holly so you know we start to we're already seeing our landscapes change through climate change and through pests and diseases that are having impacts on some of our acute oak decline is actually I've seen a 150 year old oak tree die in 12 months. You know, normally it was 300 years to live and 300 years to die. It doesn't seem to happen like that anymore. So it, it, it is of concern. I do think we need to think, um, think ahead in what we're doing and why we're doing and what impacts that will have. Um, so and the, but there are, you know, I sit with Tom on. I'm positive. I think we can uh, we can make it more diverse, more dynamic, uh, and we can uh, make it more resilient. Thanks, Jake. I, I also uh, I also have a actually have a history degree, so I, I'm gonna I'm gonna pass on that one. Uh, but I I mean I I the I think the unknowable things is 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 really relevant. You know, I, it's something we experience. You know. 90% of what we get up to in our in our rewilding area, the interventions that we do make are controlling rhododendron and controlling muntjac and Chinese water deer um, and squirrels, grey squirrels. I mean, that's that, you know, that's and, you know, these things are coming in, these these non-native species at something like 50 per year. And I, I know most of them are sort of plants and inverts, but, you know, there, there's so much that can go wrong. Um, and I'm I'm sure that we'll I'm I'm, I'm not sure, but I. Although I'm, I am also in the optimistic camp, I, I, I bet we'll have something with oaks. You know, I, I just, I just, you know, that's that seems to be the direction of travel, um, and that's one reason to be really careful about the way we, the way that we're planting in the future, um, and, and where we're sourcing our our sapling from. But more, you know, 
more more regenerated landscapes more 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 farming with nature um more areas set aside for um different types of managing for conservation in, you know you know dynamic vibrant rural uh you know circular economies i mean that, that would be my that would be my dream oliver rackham's great uh, great quote the best way to create a woodland is to do nothing and then we'll see what's right for the landscape thanks jake um and so i think that we've probably wrapped up most of the questions that have come through today um and oh i've just been handed something here um which says um this is a quick question probably for more for dom and jake um which is um what can what uh who can farmers turn to if they want to go get advice on this sort of thing and um, what would your um what would you suggest Stony silence. Jake, I think you should, I think you should answer that. I have my hand up about something else, which we might come back to this time. Um, so uh, uh, that's so I I'm so that's a real problem currently because actually the conventional farmers are being challenged with something that they don't know. I had I had a meeting uh, a year ago with a farmer who is exceptionally good at producing food, and actually he does look after his biodiversity and his natural capital relatively well, but he knows he has to go further. And his question to a member of Natural England that was there was, I've spent 40 years killing everything and I don't know how, I need the advice and the, the skills and expertise to how to make it better. So those are the challenges. More recently, uh, uh, I uh, spoke to Basis um, and basis uh, gives all of the advice to farm agronomists. Um, and I uh, have requested that they put in a module for environmental advice because farm agronomists are trusted by farmers. If I send someone who's beard toting, sandal wearing, caftan wearing onto a farm, actually the average age of a British farmer, which is 59, they're not going to entertain him quite frankly, but if I have someone they have trusted and they have worked with and says, actually, this is a direction we need to go and we can make your soils more resilient and we can reduce your insecticide bill and your nitrogen bill, actually, those are the people that I think will in the future provide the best advice. Um, so I, th I think we don't have the advice currently for what we need, but I think it's coming down the road. Great, thank you. And Dom, and I know you wanted to add something in, so. Well, I, if there was time, I thought there was a really interesting question that was not put in the Q&A, which I know they're supposed to be put, but uh, around, you know, what, what Jake was describing earlier about the about the blended finance um, and about the role, uh, you know, of private finance from large corporations uh, will play in the future. And in, and in particular, I think the nervousness, and I would share some of this nervousness about, you know, the concept of, let's say, um, you know, private equity funds or for pension funds uh, purchasing land to restore it, which in itself is probably a good thing. But, um, you know, whether that structure of ownership is is really what we want. Um, and I, I thought it's quite an interesting question. I, I mean, the question that, you know, is about greenwashing, which, you know, is something separate. But, you know, I think that it, it's something that I I... I have thought about and sometimes concerns me. Um, and I was interested to hear both Jake's and, and Tom's views on that, actually. I'd love to hear, to hear Tom's views on land ownership. He must have a whole history book on it. I won't get stuck into that. I won't, I won't, be, I won't be taken down that winding road. I think that um, I, I, I share Dominic's unease I suppose that's just born of politics. I worry about greenwashing as a as a thing. But on the other hand, um, I suppose I think the situation is so critical that we have to sort of suspend our moral judgments on certain things. I, I, whatever works, I think. I think we're in that situation now. If it does work, then we have to do it. Thanks, Tom. 
Are we going right. to have a chance to just say, are we about to wind, wind up? Because I just, Yeah, we are. Go on. Oh, well, I'm going to say something first. And that is, um, uh, Dominic and, and Jake, when the, uh, when the spring comes, going <laughs> to come round? Of course. You know, you're always welcome, Tom. Great. Se seconded. Brilliant. <laughs> Um, I'll see you in the spring. <laughs> Before Tom wraps up with his private private invites, um, I was just going to see um, if anyone's got any sort of final closing remarks or any closing comments before I round off the session. Um, it's not broken and we can fix it. We just need the ambition. We need to have the conversations and we need to collaborate um, uh, with everyone. So, so uh, whether it's the urban population, those on the fringe, those within the farming sector, you know, we we can do this. We need to work together, and it is possible. Um, because I know I want to hand something uh, to my children that it was in a better condition than I took it on. Thank you, Jake. And I won't um, I won't tarnish that with trying to add any comments of my own. Um, but what I would just very briefly say is that. Um, this event was being held as part of Greenfield. This is my shameless plug. We've got two weeks of events that are running until um, the 12th of November. Um, so if anyone's interested in what you heard today, then um, please do check out our other events. Um, and I just wanted to say just a, a really, really massive thank you um, to Tom, Jake and to Dom for joining us today and for giving up their time and for um, hopefully entertaining and inspiring us um, with, with that conversation and with the talks that they presented. So thank you so much to all three of you. Um, yeah, we, uh, it, was, it was a great session and, and people are already um, saying that they enjoyed your contributions in the chat bar today. So thank you so much. And um, thank you everyone for joining us. And um, we look forward to seeing you at some of our next events. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you all, bye.